Hi everybody, it's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz, happy to be back with you. The last time I saw our guest, I was holding a microphone for her during a radio interview at Birdland in Manhattan. It was one of the few times that I've ever worked as a radio field producer. And in retrospect, it was the only time I've ever been involved in an interview, in an interview where the entire production team and the subject were all Latino. There is a dearth of us in this business, and Maria Hinojosa is one of the survivors and thrivers. She's president and founder of Futuro Media, executive producer and anchor of Latino USA, and author of Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. It is a pleasure to welcome Maria Hinojosa to Reporters Roundtable. Maria, bienvenidos. Hey, David, David, it's good to be with you. What's up? What's up? What's up, New Jersey? Same. A lot of love for New Jersey. <laughs> Great. So, so your book begins with the story of your encounter with a little girl in an airport in McAllen, Texas. She was part of a group of kids just arriving in the States. That was 2019. But you have been covering immigration for your entire professional career and had seen that movie before many times, no? So here's the thing, David, I wrote Once I Was You, um, and I, I it was hard because I wasn't even planning on writing the book, and I feel like a lot of things happened um, during the last uh, presidential administration that were very difficult, but there were also some things that happened as a result of it that were gifts, and Once I Was You is that. I don't know if I would have written this book had it not been for the circumstances um, that we were living through in the last uh, administration. So I finished the book, handed in to my editor, who, by the way, is a Latina, Michelle Herrera Mulligan, proud Mexicana Irish from Chicago. And she says, uh, okay, now go back and write, write the introduction. And I was like, write the introduction? I already wrote the book. Are, aren't we done? And Sandra Cisneros, the great American writer, told me to write not just about what you remember, what, but write about what you wish you could forget. And that scene in the airport in McAllen is a scene that I wish I could forget. It's a little girl who, for all intents and purposes, being trafficked um, by people being paid by the U.S. government. I mean, I use these terms because they are shocking, but it is, in fact, what's happening. These children did not have their passports or any identification. They did not know where they were going. They did not know who was taking them. They had been told that they could not speak to anybody those are the definition of people who are being trafficked. Um, and so I have this encounter and I, I start the book because it's really about finding our common humanity. That's the title of the book, Once I Was You. In many ways, it's trying to say, in some ways, once I was this little girl. I don't want to reveal too much. No, I'm certainly But something is revealed in this book that turns out I could have been one of those children who had been taken from their parent when I arrived with privilege, with a green card. And so part of the message is we, we are in this, you know, Americans are tied together. Once I was you, once you were me, can we begin to see ourselves in each other? And that that is also a deeply central part of our immigration story in this country. And here we are again, new administration, perhaps kinder, gentler rhetoric, rhetoric but still hundreds of kids again alone at the border in what you call concentration camps. Any difference in the border situation now? Well, look, the Biden administration, Joe Biden, he knew what was going to happen. Why? Because children coming, refugee children, desperate people um, have been, specifically refugee children, have been on the uptake since the late 1990s. So it's not like they can all of a sudden just be like, oh my gosh, what happened here? They should have been better prepared. But I, I talk about changing the narrative, David. I, I talk about why is it that the administration continues to say things like, uh, don't, don't come to this country. This is not necessarily a good time to come. That is so inappropriate and insensitive to say to somebody who is a refugee, 
do, do you understand? That would be like saying to somebody who was escaping Nazi Germany, you know what, don't, don't come right now. It's, it's not a good time for our borders. No, 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 no. These are refugees and we need to see them as such. Also, I've really pushed David. I mean, I, I know people think that I'm sounding extreme and we're looking at these pictures. Joe Biden should be there welcoming them. He should be there saying, I see you. I see that you are not a threat to this country. I see that you only want to bring the best of yourself. And you know what? All of these people will gladly register, get into line, whatever that, there is no line per se. And you're talking about people who are desperate. So the, the, the framing of the conversation needs to be changed. And we, all of us, the people of New Jersey, those of us in New York, we have to see them as our brothers and sisters. Hello, I mean, isn't the Statue of Liberty just kind of down the street from us? We have to embody that in this moment historically. And that's kind of what I wish this administration would understand. It's like, it's their moment to change the narrative entirely. And by the way, just to end, not everybody wants to come to this country, okay? You're not talking about three million, five million people, half a million. You're talking about a few thousand people. So understand that, that not everybody wants to be here. But those who are making this trek, those are the survivors. I want to meet them. I want them here. I want them to help build up our country. I want to talk a little bit about uh, your career in a few minutes we have left. You worked all over the country, and I wonder what it was like in, in the newsroom as a Latina trying to tell stories about marginalized people. I mean, I lived my journalistic career in uh, so-called progressive New Jersey, in supposedly progressive public media, and I have felt a thousand small cuts of racism, but also of indifference. I once had a producer tell me that people with accents are hard to understand, so we shouldn't interview them. I mean, newsrooms are getting a little more diverse, but that doesn't just happen, right? I mean, it takes a hundred uncomfortable conversations with people who don't, don't understand why it's important to have a diverse newsroom. Look, you know, the, the problem is, is that there's, and I'm so sorry that you've had to go through that. Um, you know, you and I, David, we don't have to be, we're, we love what we do, we're, we're journalists, we love this, but we shouldn't have to be warriors in order to be Latino and Latina journalists in the United States of America. Yes, I trace my roots back as an American journalist to my founding father, Frederick Douglass, who was the editor and publisher of the North Star, but who was born into slavery. It, he is my founding father as an American journalist, and that's what allows me to center myself. I didn't have that analysis as a young woman when I was the first Latina hired at NPR, then the first Latina correspondent hired at NPR, then the first Latina at CNN, the first Latina correspondent at PBS. And now I created my own company. It's a nonprofit. It's called Futuro Media, and I'm the first Latina to run a national nonprofit independent newsroom based out of Harlem in New, here in, in New York. So um, here's the thing. The reason why I want more people to become journalists writ large, to become journalists of conscience, and those of you who are Latino or Latina, journalists of color, do this work. We need you. This is your civic duty. If you have a passion for journalism, the way David and I do, you're going to have to withstand those hundred cuts or thousand cuts, no matter where you are. We need you as journalists, bringing your whole self into the newsroom. Because you know what? Our country is going to be the better for it. When we don't have representative media, when we don't have representative book publishers, public radio, independent, all of us suffer. It's not excellent journalism when it is not truly representative. All right, Maria, you know, Jose, the book is Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. And of course, Latino USA continues. You can catch it on WNYC every week. Great to see you again, Senora. Thanks for taking a few minutes with us. Un placer. Thank you all. All right, let's bring our panel in here. Stacy Barchenger is the State House reporter for the record, USA Today Network. Uh, Sam Sutton is health reporter for uh, Politico NJ, and Sean Sullivan 
is reporter for NJ Advanced Media Panel. Welcome. We heard from Maria Hinojosa there, who's been covering immigration for decades. You know, and attention to that issue has been growing in New Jersey. This week, advocates uh, raised the volume again. Several undocumented workers starting a hunger strike outside the state house while the budget hearings got underway. Uh, they want the state to provide some kind of financial assistance. Many of the folks, they've been out of work uh, for a year. Uh, they don't qualify for unemployment, uh, let alone any kind of stimulus checks because of their status. Stacey, the governor says he wants to try to help, but some lawmakers say citizens need help first. What are the advocates saying? Well, the, the advocates are pointing out that these families are working families here in New Jersey. They support the New Jersey economy, um, and they have been largely left out of the benefits of the recent stimulus uh, packages. Um, you know, while others got three checks to help them keep their families and their budgets afloat during the coronavirus pandemic, um, a lot of um, undocumented families did not get those benefits. Um, they also point to there was an, a recent agreement in New York that New York would put, uh, I believe, $2 billion um, in its budget to help support these um, undocumented working families that have not seen the benefits of the federal stimulus. Any sense that, that lawmakers are inclined to do that here in Jersey? Well, I think, you know, we saw the Latino caucus push for this this week, um, especially, um, but we're sort of in the middle of this budget decision making that's that's going to happen over the next um, the next couple of months. So it, it really will be up to the legislature to see like what they put in their final budget budget bill. All right, let's get into these budget hearings. I think the headline of the week was lawmakers pushing back against this $4 billion the governor borrowed last year in anticipation of budget deficits that I guess never came. The state is evidently flush with cash now, and I guess they don't need the money. What's this all about, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that OLS earlier this week came in and said that revenue projections are going to be about $550 million greater than what uh, Treasury had said a few months before. Um, I think that on one hand, yes, that is a sign that the state's balance sheet is much healthier than folks may have thought six to eight months ago. But I, I did find it interesting that both the governor and the treasurer uh, repeatedly pointed out that there was kind of tremendous uncertainty at the time this money was borrowed in November. Um, I also found it interesting that even though OLS was saying that, you know, our uh, our balance sheet looks a lot better than everyone thought. You know, barring changes, New Jersey could be staring at a fiscal cliff somewhere two or three years down the line. Um, right. And look, this, right. is, this is above my pay grade, but you know, revenues are brighter now than what we expected. But the economy has a lot of cash and low interest rates floating around, and I think that's allowed people to paper over some of the um, very obvious cracks that are uh, in our economic system right now. Commercial real estate isn't looking great. Uh, I know there's been a lot written about evictions and the wave of evictions that will be coming soon. We just spent a lot of time talking about the lack of aid that was provided to undocumented populations. Auto loans are looking really bad. You know, uncertain, there's, there's a lot more money than everyone thought, but there's also a lot more uncertainty, I think, than folks thought um, at this point last year. Yeah, reality check uh, on the way. Four billion is chunk change, though. When you think about the two trillion plus, <laughs> The president wants to spend for infrastructure, but he's getting pushed back from his own party. Some Democrats say they want um, the SALT deduction restored. Uh, Sean, 50-50 Senate, suddenly every Democrat has the power to derail a bill. What's the SALT, the SALT deduction thing about? Um, well, um, <laughs> I might not be the best person to speak to this because I'm not an economics reporter, but... <laughs> Maybe somebody else on the panel could help me out. How about it, Stacey? I'll, yeah, so, um, yeah, so um, the, pr the president wants to spend $2 trillion to fix infrastructure across the country, things like lead pipes, which are certainly a problem um, here in New Jersey, um, bridges, rail tunnels. Um, but we've seen this salt, salt deduction, which um, 
in case folks don't know what it is, in 2017, there was a cap put in place that said you could only deduct $10,000 from your taxes, um, your federal taxes for state and local taxes. It really matters in states like New Jersey because we have such high property taxes. Um, but there are some lawmakers, Congressman Josh Gottheimer and Bill Pascrell here in New Jersey, who um, are saying they won't support the president's uh, infrastructure plan unless it includes a salt cap repeal. Um, they're, of course, both both Democrats, um, and we'll see over the next couple of months um, as Congress starts vetting this infrastructure plan what actually comes to be. It reminds me of the early days of the Obama administration when they were talking about uh, health care reform, and then suddenly all these Democrats uh, started to feel their oats and uh, almost derailed that whole thing. Let's see if that happens with uh, this infrastructure bill. All right, other news of the week, Sean, the Attorney General's office launched an online portal on the use of force by police in the state. Kudos to you and your colleagues. Your reporting was the impetus for all this. That's gotta feel pretty good. Tell us about the portal and what impact it might have and whether or not you, you've checked it out this week. Yeah, so the, the portal uh, aims to be a kind of compendium of every use of force incident uh, involving police officers in the state. And um, that use of force can mean anything from a compliance hold to uh, an officer uh, fatally shooting a sus suspect. And so um, there's quite a continuum there. Uh, and, you know, we uh, a couple of years ago undertook the uh, massive task of turning what used to be paper records uh, into a database and found um, some pretty troubling racial disparities and also some serious outliers uh, in terms of uh, which which police officers are using force. And so um, looking at the uh, AG's data, uh, a lot of that, those problems seem to persist. I mean, this is a small window. We looked at five years of data right now. The portal uh, is up and running with just uh, five months of data. Uh, and so that's a little bit of, uh, of a narrower snapshot, but you're still seeing widespread uh, racial disparities. Um, and, uh, you know, another troubling uh, thing is, is just, you know, we had suspected that a lot of police calls had to do, that ended up with uh, use of force had to do with um, what they call emotionally disturbed persons, people experiencing mental health crises. Um, but actually, the you know uh, we weren't able to quantify that because the forms never used to uh, record that information. Now, now they do, uh, and it is uh, it is staggering uh, the number of uh, mental health cases that end up with police intervention that lead to um, you know uh, use of force to restrain uh, uh, you know somebody undergoing a mental health crisis. And it, it um, buttresses the case. Uh, that a lot of people have been making that maybe this is not the work that cops should be doing. You know, when you talk about people who, who say uh, defund the police, um, this is kind of what they're talking about, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there is a question uh, particularly about, you know, to what extent should police officers uh, be social workers, be the first responders for uh, things that are non-criminal in nature. You know, having a mental health episode isn't a crime. Sometimes people do commit crimes when they are undergoing a mental health episode. Um, but, you know, police officers have to, uh, are increasingly being relied upon to um, fill in the gaps for, um, you know, crumbling or crumbling social safety net. And uh, there are a lot of folks that say, you know, uh, not, you know, the, the police may need to respond to someone who's being violent, who's having a medical episode, but, um, you know, having cri crisis intervention intervention uh, trained social workers might be a, a better way to address this stuff. Yeah. Suffice to say that we need more data, right? I mean, five months of data does not uh, uh, an appropriate or full picture make. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I've been uh, I've been fairly impressed fairly with the impressed. Um, new reporting model that the uh, attorney general's office has rolled out. But, it, you know, like anything in government, it's going to rely on compliance. And you have more than 500 uh, uh, municipalities in New Jersey, uh, almost as many uh, police departments. And you have to train every single one of them on, uh, you know, uh, accurately capturing this data. Um, you know, we found out this week that we're, that we're still relying on police to report the demographic data of arrestees. And so you're now asking a police officer to determine uh, so somebody's race, to determine uh, their gender. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, there are still going to be uh, hiccups in the reporting and uh, compliance issues, frankly. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of at least one police shooting that isn't, that isn't represented in the data um, that, that ought to be. And so, you know, those are uh, cases that, uh, you know, 
they're going to rely on, on, on us to keep digging into the data uh, and making sure that everything's being captured. All right. The governor and the first lady were scheduled to get their COVID shots this week, but the governor also warned that there's going to be another shortage of Johnson and Johnson jabs. Sam, if you want to get people vaccinated, it helps to have vaccine around, no? Yeah, it, it certainly does. And it's it's looking like New Jersey is going to have, uh, based on the numbers that uh, the health commissioner put out earlier this week, around 200,000 fewer vaccines over the next couple of weeks than they expected. Um, I know that the administration has kind of framed this as if you're going to have a shortage, it's good to have a shortage of the, the one shot dose because you're only screwing with one appointment as opposed to two. But, you know, I think it's important to remember that these J&J &J doses were being and are still being touted as a, a really important tool for getting into communities where vaccine pickup just hasn't been where it needs to be. I'm speaking specifically about uh, black and Latino communities, as well as uh, some of the more rural parts of the state. So, you know, absent that for a couple of weeks, that's going to be a lot harder. And dovetailing with that, we have you know a lot of variants that are uh, making things a lot harder from a public health standpoint right now. So if you have 200,000 fewer folks vaccinated over the next two weeks, that's 200,000 fewer folks, uh, 200,000 more folks, I should say, who are still exposed to a you know potentially fatal death virus. You also had a piece this week about Chris Christie's nonprofit raising a lot of money. Nobody knows where it's actually gone. Uh, no one knows where it's gone and no one knows who, who gave it. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit early in the game for that. Um, the way that this works is Christie's uh, nonprofit uh, is, it has to file what's called a Form 990 with the IRS. But before it does that, it provides some data to the IRS about its, its assets, its revenues. Um, the kind of aggregated data that I saw showed that the uh, Public Policy Institute had raised a little bit more than $500,000 in its first year of operation in 2019 and had about $270,000, $280,000 worth of assets. Now, we don't know if that money came from Christie himself. He's a, he's a rather wealthy man. We don't know if that came from Seton Hall, which is the organization or the uh, institution that is you know, uh, partnering with Christie on this thing. Or we don't know if it came from you know folks who are uh, interested parties across the state. So as with everything Christie post, post, uh, post second term, you know, there's a lot of questions, and, and it's, a, it's an interesting place to always be uh, taking a look. We also saw the uh, State Corrections Commissioner get a grilling before an assembly uh, committee this week, uh, specifically about the Edna Mann uh, prison. Uh, Stacey, what, how did he do? Uh, well, based on what lawmakers said after the hearing, and just for context, this took like eight hours. He testified for yeah. about three and a half hours and answered questions. Um, lawmakers, uh, I think, were encouraged to hear about some of the reforms that are in place, but also still recognize that there is a, just a culture of sexual abuse at this prison that has endured for 10 years. Um, and that's sort of the, the question is how do you how do you fix something that has been such a problem and so just a part of this prison um, where, you know, 370 women live? Um, how do you fix it when it's been a problem for so long? Is there any sense that his uh, coming to to the assembly committee and answering all of these questions? Is there any sense that that helps his case? And, and maybe um, gets him, uh, I don't know, uh, a parole from the, from the governor? Um, well, I think the governor has stood by him um, despite you know, every Senate Democrat calling on him to step aside um, after these, these most recent allegations of assault and abuse in January. Um, I, he, he has not appeared previously before lawmakers on this specific issue. And so I do think, you know, uh, assembly members made it a point yesterday to thank him for um, showing up. All right, that's gonna be round table for today. Thanks to our guest, Maria Hinojosa, and our panel here. Lost my place. All right, that's roundtable for today. Thanks to our guest, Maria Hinojosa, and to our panel, Stacey Barchender, Sean Sullivan, and Sam Sutton. 
You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz NJ, and be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more great content, including Chatbox, NJ Business Beat, and NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosa. I'm David Cruz. For the entire crew over here, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support is provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954.